the confinement of here is the place we ought to be here. But remember the many drugs and many modalities which are mentioned beyond PPI are still not available. So what I would do is just have a recap of what is actually existing, look at it more objectively and subsequently move on to what are various latest advances and what we are expecting in near future regarding this problem. We all know that it's a very common problem, almost 15% of the population suffers from GRD. Incidence is more in the western hemisphere compared to what we have in Asia. 25% of the people who continue to have the problem on a weekly basis and 7% continue to have it almost a daily basis. You have various kinds of presentations, so for typical symptoms, all of which are you are aware of, the heart bones, the rehabilitation, water brush, dysphagia sometimes. But there are many atypical presentations also which we must remember, which are now categorized under the category of so-called exercise of hearing good that Dr. Sainani has just mentioned where you have various respiratory problems, posters of voice, global sensations, you have nocturnal asthma related to this, and sometimes even idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and so on. So many of these exactly, they are difficult to understand, recognize also because many people who suffer from these extra will features of GERD actually, almost 30% of them will not have classical symptoms of GERD like heart bone or legal edition. So what are the goals of therapy? If you look at the category of GRD patient, you have three basic categories. People who have erosiosophagitis, those people who do not have any finding of endoscopy, the so-called nerd or the non-erosive reflex disease, and the third category is that of patients who have parent disorders, may or may not be associated with symptoms. So the goals of therapy would be patients who do not have any erosiosophagitis endoscopy, you try to relieve the reflex symptoms, prevent frequent symptomatic relapses. Those who have actually endoscopic esophagitis that you identify on endoscopy, you try to relieve their symptoms. Heal esophagitis, that is one of the important uh, endpoints, and you prevent further relapses and complications related to this problem. <coughs> if you look at the overall population of GERD, it's a thing, a kind of despair, kind of an iceberg phenomenon. That means a large majority of these people do not come to the physician, but they self medicate with various non prescription and medications and some other lifestyle changes. Only patients who have very serious symptoms, reflux complications like dysphagia, sometimes apogea bleed, severe burning water brands, they are the persons who actually come to the physicians. So there is a large population of patients who are still buried underneath who will never come to the doctors. A large number of lifestyle modifications have been mentioned in managing good patients. We all know that you have to avoid certain food items. Elevation of head of the bed, for example, 10 to 6, six to 10 inches. Very specific activities like bending work, strenuous exercise. You always ask them not to take heavy meals. Do not work, bend, do strenuous exercise after meals and all these things. But remember, there have been various studies which have actually tried to objectively as to the efficacy of various kinds of recommendations that are there. Many of these have been published recently in the American College of Gastronomy Guidelines also. Like they are there, what has been mentioned finally is lifestyle modifications in general are helpful only in mild and intermittent complaints if used alone. GRD improvement have been demonstrated in case in those studies only with three modalities that is elevation of the head of the bed which is very important, weight loss in obese patients and having a lateral left lateral decoded position while sleeping. On the right side of the it enhances reflux, but on the left side if you sleep in the night, it reduces reflux. Now coming to certain noticing medications, like I have already mentioned, they are all of these patients, many of these patients actually still medicate. Entasics have been one of the mainstay long back, still they are used, but they give rise to only minimal symptomatic improvement. One of them has found its use back again, 20 years back we were using antigen to manage their entasics. In between, they were lost and suddenly they have come back to the forefront because of the proposition of so-called acid pocket in the genesis of gastrointestinal reflux disease. It is known that when you consume food, the food neutralizes the acid. But a small proportion of this in the top of the stomach actually the acid remains unbuffered. In patients who have had a dhanya, this acid collects in that particular acid pocket and is responsible for pathological reflux in these patients. So Gaviscon contains algeric acid which forms a kind of a form of rat on the top of this thing and prevents the rehydration or rather rat if it prevents or reduces the acid pocket in this particular situation and prevents the reflux in patient. 
find out the name. Absolute benefit was 8% number near 20 is for 4 in that particular project. There have been certain FDA recommendations for half the dose of H2RS, like iridine can be used in these patients. Again, absolute benefit around 16%, number near 20 is around 96. Remember this, these OTC medications do not heal esophagitis. Coming to prescription medications, we have been using prokaryotic drugs, they are used left and right in at least India. You will always find a combination of PPI or Dumbledore and all these things. Many prokaryotic drugs have been used. They were found to relieve reflux symptoms by either increasing the disease pressure, increasing the acid clearance, improving gastric emptying, but there was no effect on the transient low resistance relaxation. There is reduced efficacy of these prokaryotics in patients with increasing disease severity. There has been only modern benefit in central heart tone in these situations and they have absolutely unreliable efficacy in healing esophagitis when they are used alone. By and large, the recommendation is you should use them only if you demonstrate presence of any delayed gastric emptying, etc. There is no scientific basis actually to combine them with PPI and all these things in all the patients as is done in clinical practice. There is a category of drugs, the so called transient low resource pinched relaxation inhibitors. Now, transient low resource relaxations are one of the major things. These relaxations play a major role in producing pathological reflux in patients who have got GI. There have been drugs which are proposed. There are certain GABA B agonists, for example, Baclofen, which has been used clinically for managing spasticity for a very long time. We have been using that. A dose of 5 to 20 milligrams three times a day has been recommended. Sometimes the patients are resistant to PPI and all these So they mentioned that you can use these particular drugs in those situations where the effect of PPI is not very great. But the present recommendation by the American College of Gastroenterology Guidelines is the Baclofen should be used only if you demonstrate clear that reflux on your pH or reflux manometric studies. There have been other drugs also in this particular category, which is like Lysocabral was used as carbocarbyl, but the efficacy of these drugs has not been very high, so they have been withdrawn from the market. H2I's are equally effective in using proper doses in controlling nocturnal and meat stimulated acidic secretion. Heart one is definitely reduced, but rarely completely abolished. However, if you have healed in only 60% patients, we will use for 3 months. Healing again depends on the amount of severity. The more the severity of the exposure the less is the response. There has been a problem of tolerance with long-term administration. You give PPIs for more than 2 weeks or 3 weeks, for example, the effect starts to become less and less because tolerance levels in these patients. These are some of the, uh, I mean, the doses in which we can be used. Now, PPIs in fact form a mainstay of medical treatment. They reduce meat stimulated nocturnal acid secretion with much greater degree than H2RS. However, PPIs do not cure GID. They treat GID by reducing acid reflux episode. However, the weekly acidic episodes increase the total number of reflux episodes and the possible extent of reflux is not affected by PPIs. Moreover, PPIs will not have an effect on non-acid reflux, like for example, bile reflux, where it will not have any effect. They maintain pH more than 4 to 10 to 14 hours. That they are not effective for entire 24 hours, given given in doses. They relieve heart pain symptoms completely within 1 to 2 weeks. Efficacy is, however, remember this. Best efficacy is seen in those situations where you have endoscopic erosive isolatis. Where endoscopy is normal, the efficacy drops as far as PPI is concerned. Like efficacy would be 20 to 35 percent times lower in those patients who have a normal endoscopy in patients who have a reflux, I mean, GRT symptoms. Moreover, volume reflux, for example, the regulation does not have a robust response to PPI. It doesn't respond well, and many times these patients have to send for lab endocrinization. <coughs> Complete healing is seen after 8 weeks in almost 80 percent with PPI. Compared to H2RS, then it is just 50%. These are some of the equivalent doses for other kinds of the medications. Now, coming to maintenance therapy, fever erosive isovariatis will relapse within 6 months on stopping medication, 80% of the patients. On the other hand, if you have just a minor grade of 15 to 30% will relapse. All PPIs, sometimes are half the dose are used sometimes for maintenance therapy. All the recommended PPIs, once the patient has healed isovariatis, you can continue with the patient on maintenance therapy. Who receive, has to receive maintenance therapy that we will mention. Patients who have very mild severity or those who are nerd, for example, can be given a therapy for 
two to three months, subsequently the drugs can be withdrawn. And then an all demand therapy is recommended for these patients. But those patients who have very severe mental disability in Barrett, etc., so continuous maintenance therapy is recommended. Coming to step down, 58% of chronic PMUs can be switched to RLO prokinetics for taken off the medication. That was the study. Patient was symptomatic in PPI. If they continue to have the symptoms and if they do not respond to PPI, you have to look for other etiologies like histopheric variety, the case and so on. There have been many lockdowns that is important to address. Lockdown PPI issues, people have been grumbling for a long time, they are taking for years together, what are the side effects. There are numerous studies which have shown some anecdotal studies were there, anecdotal reports were there for various kinds of side effects which are not mentioned with PPI. But what has been mentioned very clearly is most of those studies had flaws and they were not considered definitive. They do not establish a cause and effect relationship between PPI and adverse conditions. High quality studies have found that PPI do not significantly increase the risk of any of these conditions except intestinal infections. Like instead of the CD disease, for example, or some other intestinal infections, they certainly increase PPI. For the treatment of GRD, gastroenterology, all of us agree that well established benefits of PPI are far off with their theoretical risk. So these are very safe risks to be taken continuously. Now there are certain unmet needs in GRD. Beyond that, we come to certain reward risks. 10 to 15 percent of Isabel Nisbayat is the they fail to achieve complete healing in 8 weeks. 40% of nerd patients or 30 to 40 percent remain symptomatic while on standard dose of PPI. Extra insulin blood response poorly. There is a problem of postprandial heartburn in many of these patients and the control of volume weakness and relief of nocturnal symptoms, especially in patients who have barrett silvergas. What is the exact amount of acid control that you really require in patients with barrett silvergas? That is also not very clear. So now looking at that, there have been certain new and future drug development here. Now remember, the majority of these drugs are yet not available. Some of them are available. Some newer HLRs, for example, Lefodidine, which is available with us. Nizadine has been there. Another drug, the so-called Roxidine, is there. Then you have a category of extended relief PPI, where you have Dexlansoprazole, which is there with us. Advantage of these drugs, for example, Dexlansoprazole is all PPIs, for example, which are mentioned there. Conventional PPIs, which are available, are strictly related to the meal time. You require a very active kind of hardware protection ATP or the battery pump of the missing uh, that particular pump which leads to like you. A proper activation of that pump is required for the action of PPI. And the pump is maximally activated at a time when you are about to consume your meals. So in that situation, that is why all the PPIs have to be administered about half an hour before administration of the meal. These drugs, for example, Dex Lanthobras, etc., are certainly different. They have granules which release at different pH levels and a strict relationship to the meal timing is not required. So if people who are very busy many times they forget to take their drugs on time all these things, these situations, these preparations are very useful. And definitely it works better than many of the PPI and therapy discoveries. Then you have tenetoprazole, you have a four drug of omeprazole, LVM. Then various kinds of PPI combinations are mentioned. PPI with antacid was available here for a long time. You have weak air, for example, omeprazole along with succinic acid which results in actually much stimulation or much faster activation of the gastric pumps. And there are so many other drugs also like secretol is there where you use the combination of omeprazole and lexoprazole for that pattern. Then you have another category of drugs which probably will be an alternative for something beyond PPI which will come in market. They are already there in some international, uh, some countries. You are like one of the other humorate is there, introduced by Tagra Pharmaceuticals first time in Japan. You have Linsa Pradhan, Lora Pradhan, what Tela Pradhan has come, recently launched in South Korea for example, yet to come here. Then you have polycystogonium gasping receptor antagonist, Loxygluide is for there, I have some trials with this. Newer kinds of prokinetics, azathioprine for example has been used, prothulopride which we have been using and homocetrac for example already available. They can also be utilized in managing GRDs. Then certain visceral analgesics, Dr. Sarani has already mentioned about trichotic antidepressants and other things. Various mucosal products that are just two months. Drogamide, etc. I am not going to detail but it is just to tell you that beyond PPI, these are some of the medications which are there likely to come. The most likely medicines that will come probably are the I think you have put up time on there. So these are the most Now coming to certain 
I was told to talk about certain known endoscopic therapies. There are certain known endoscopic therapies which are also on coming on horizon. Many of the endoscopic therapies starting somewhere from year 2000 were there in clinical practice like endosin, endioplacator, endrix and all these things. They have gone to the graveyard of endoscopy because they were introduced. Didn't show long of efficacy, they had many serious side effects, they have been withdrawn. But there are certain newer endoscopic modalities. Among them, endoscopic trans oral incision and spondoplacation is one thing in competition with the usual kind of a lab spondoplacation is there. And the strata is another, the radio frequency stimulation of lower scale filters, the strata. These are the only two modalities that clinically we tried and had a experience for almost about 10 years. So, uh, Just two minutes I'll take that so. so these are various trials of various drugs which are mentioned. Phase 2, phase 2 and phase 3 trials of various kinds of drugs which are there which are mentioned here. So I will not go into details there. We have already talked about refractory GERD and exoisal GERD, so I'll skip this. So these endoscopic therapies have potential to bridge a gap between medical and surgical treatment. Many patients do not want surgery at the same time they want, don't want to continue medicine. Important thing is, this table is very important. All the currently available endoscopic anti-reflex therapies are better avoided. This is not an indication, rather the contraindication for using endoscopic therapies. Large hydrogenia, health grade 3 or 4, flap wall, severe esophagitis, poor symptom correlation on pH impedance, psychological comorbidities, functional heart work, ineffective use of various calcium, high PMI. These are contraindications for using endoscopic therapies. So in one line I can tell you all the known endoscopic therapies which are available that you can you have anti reflux mucosectomy, you have RAS, oral incision and photoplagation, you have vertex and so many other modalities also which are there. By and large are used for milder kind of use of variety in patients who don't want to consume medicines for a long time at the same time try to avoid surgery. Thank you all.